So first and foremost, my name is Dr. Judy St. Ledger, as Dr. Ben Watson has said. And I'm the pathologist in charge of a lot of the necropsy evaluations that happen at the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens parks. Those are the folks that pay my salary day to day. Now, what you may not know is that pretty much the doctor teams that work at these parks not only work with the animals in our collection, and that's everything from fish to sea turtles to birds to marine mammals, but we also do a tremendous amount of work. Matter of fact, in my world, more of my work is with wildlife species than it is even with captive animal species. So I work with biologists throughout the country and indeed throughout the world who work with marine mammals both on the west coast and the east coast of the U.S. And much of what I do is not just why did the animal die, but what can we learn from this particular animal and then what else can that tell us? And this gets down to Dr. Ben Watson's tell us what the best practices are. What I'd like to do is to talk about a project that I became involved in in November of last year that sort of ongoing and will continue through a fair bit of 2013 and by the looks of it far on beyond there and sort of use this project as an example of what are we doing sort of for best practices, how are we getting the most information we can from animals that we look at that have died. Dr. Sippy, I have great news for you. Ultrasound, aggressive behaviors, anesthesia, not an issue. In this world. Okay. So many folks sort of look at pathologists and they say, this is, you know, this is what you're doing. It's sort of uh, really sort of down and dirty, crude investigations. When we're talking about best practices, we go from the individual who's just looking at an animal that's died to sort of a team of folks that are trying to answer a variety of questions from this tremendous opportunity we have to access wildlife that we wouldn't have. It's difficult to put an ultrasound probe on a large whale, but when the large whale is on the beach, water and movement are no longer an issue. Now there's other issues, and we'll talk about those as well, but certainly the issues we have to face are different. When I thought about what do I want for best practices and how does it fit into our ocean health, health index evaluation, I said, well, what are the things that we're measuring and looking at with the Ocean Health Index? And certainly food provision. What's, what's the fish availability in, in ocean areas is important. Well, let's take a look at that in retrospect and in the context of these marine mammals that we're looking at. Certainly prey availability is something we'd like to have a handle on. And it's one of the things we can look at. You heard earlier this morning a lot of folks looking at what's the diet composition of a number of the pinniped species. Well, it's not just pinnipeds that that's important in, it's all marine mammals. And so when we look at not only what are you eating, what is the abundance of what you're eating, and how does that impact both your health as well as your ability to be subject to a variety of different health concerns is really important. Now, artisanal fishing is important, but we certainly know that human interaction concerns and fishing impacts on marine mammals are a great concern. Natural products, carbon storage, even things like coastal protection, they all either have a direct or indirect relationship to the health of animals in the ocean. And I would actually sort of put forward that many of the marine mammals we're looking at are top level predators. And we all know that when you're looking at a food chain, if you look at the top, it's going to be impacted by everything in the lower levels. So when we're looking at these animals, we not only want to look at why did it die, we want to look at what can we learn from all its interrelated connections in the ocean. And I really like the Ocean Health Index because it does just that. It takes a look at all the complexities. When Brendan Southall talked about you know, acoustic impacts, they're not just one point source concern. There's a lot of interrelated considerations. These are the kind of connections we have to look at. But these are complicated and it's really hard to grab such a tight sort of interactive network of connections. We can't evaluate all of the interactive connections in these animals. Certainly things like living animal physiology, behavior, acoustic concerns, I can't address most of those in a necropsy evaluation. But what I can do is look at a specific set of nodes in sort of the spectrum of what can we learn about the ocean. And by doing that and looking at all the other nodes that those bits of data impact, you can see we can really make a difference as long as we get a very thorough investigation, a necropsy evaluation of animals. Make sense? All right, well, let's take a look. And I promise you, I don't think I have one good, okay, maybe I have one good dead animal picture in this talk, okay? <laughs> but this is probably the first pathology talk I've ever given 
with, I don't, there's definitely no good inside and no under the microscope pictures of dead animals. But the point of that is actually what I would like from this year's meeting is input and feedback from you. Because the project that I'm working on is looking at information that's been collected from killer whale necropsies over the past seven years. What we'd like to do is to improve and enhance the necropsy exams for killer whales, not just on the west coast of the US or the Pacific Northwest or even just Alaska, but throughout the globe. And we'd like to take the killer whale and sort of elevate what we learn from these species, both related to its health as well as its natural history, and many things like what are our toxicant impacts and how do those impacts relate to other concerns we have in these animals how do we put it all together? So the project that I'm using sort of as my model for looking at these best practices is our evaluation <coughs> both of data we've collected and our prescribed protocol for collecting new data in the future. How do we put that together? So where we started with the killer whales was back between 2005 and 2007, really coming out with the big document in 2006, a number of folks got together and they said, we'd like to put together a standard protocol for the best best practices for a killer whale necropsy exam. And in the process, what we've learned is that only seven years later, we need a complete revamp of that protocol. Not that they weren't excellent practices at the time, but marine mammal knowledge and ocean health understandings have really advanced in the past seven years, really thanks to many of the folks in this room. And that being the case, we need to update what we're doing in these necropsy exams for these animals. We really want to maximize the observations that we make and the materials that are collected so it's not just an investigation of a single animal, but really how does that animal talk to us and what does it tell us about its population and the environment that population resides in. We'd like to really standardize the data reporting. If there's one thing the epidemiologists in the room have taught me, it's that you can have all the data in the world, but if it's in a drawer on your desk, you can't do much with it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We'd really like to integrate the results. And a big part of the value of this meeting, I think, is to make some connections that folks don't make on a day-to-day -day basis. Dr. Smith was saying, hey, I normally talk to veterinarians, but when I'm looking at what we see from live animals, I'd like to give you a sense of what we can learn and how valuable that can be to everyone interested in marine mammals. What's important is we'd like all those same kind of people in the room not only folks interested in marine mammals, but folks with other areas of interest as well, how do we get together and make sure we do, again, the best sort of job that we can? And again, lastly, once we have the best way to evaluate things, how do we expand it geographically beyond sort of, let's do it here, and let's do it everywhere? Make sense? Sweet, okay. So remember in 2006, Dr. Stephen Rafferty and Dr. Joe Gatos came out with the Killer Wild Necropsy and Disease Testing Protocol. And the concept behind this was, we're going to try to support all of the biologists we can to do as an intensive a medical examination as we can, and to look at the other environmental scientists who have something to learn from these animals. We talked about blubber sampling for toxin evaluations earlier. Wow, think how fabulous a big dead carcass is for toxin evaluation. <laughs> you take whatever you want. But what's important is, if you don't take it the correct way, or you don't process it or store it the correct way, it won't be any valuable, any, any value to anyone. So it's not only what we do, but how we do it that's important in this. Now, <clears throat> what do we normally evaluate? This is my one big dead animal picture. Um, this is an animal that died a couple years back in Alaska. And certainly, the standard necropsy exams, we're always looking for, what's the cause of death? Do we have <coughs> impacts of human action on these animals? Are we seeing diseases that are new and more common both in individual cases as well as within the population? And when we have unusual mortality events, what are the patterns that we see? Well, so if you're presented with the carcass of a killer whale, certainly we do the standard necropsy exam, right? You take a look at things, you take some pictures, you measure things, you get some work metrics, you get some samples, you send them in, you kind of figure out what's going on, but there's a lot more that we can do. And in the lot more that we can do, we not only think about what we're doing, but again, how we do it, how we collect it, who to send it to, and where things should go. One of the things we learned from the killer whale necropsy protocol is there was this awesome protocol, and there was 101 challenges every single time we wanted to get samples to the right person, or even things like getting the right people to the right place at the right time. 
These are simple logistics, and when you have kind of a roadmap to making them done, it makes it much easier. So that's what we're trying to do with Killer Rouse right now, to redo the roadmap. <coughs> Essentially, we want to go from that fold-out AAA map to the Google map version of how to do an ecropsy on a killer well. Now, this, I was so sad at Dr. Smith's picture because I thought this was the <laughs> awesome, okay? And I pretty much have to go home and shave now, Because okay? um, what's important to me is a necropsy exam is not just blood, gut, score, and enough. What's important is we can do a tremendous amount of examinations on these animals that have died, everything up to and including things like genomics, Advanced imaging, things like CT and MR exams. If you've worked with me before, you know with small cetaceans, that's one of my favorite things to do. Hey, let's pop it in a tube. Um, but the reason that's important is we can get a lot of valuable information. And I would challenge almost anyone in the room who's done a necropsy or even a dissection of a marine mammal to be able to look at the bones of the animal at this level of uh, sort of finesse when you're just doing a live animal dissection. I hate to admit it, but when I'm looking for bubbles, Michelle, I'd rather have a CT any day. Because once I open that animal up, I know I'm gonna miss a lot of them. Now, I'm not gonna miss all of them, thankfully. Um, however, what's important is there are different modalities that, again, have advantages and disadvantages, and one of the ones that we found is important is CT is awesome for identifying things like vascular changes or even parenchymal changes associated with gas bubbles. Um, standardizing data collection is important, and this is just a, a screenshot from a, a database sort of input page that Dr. Ben Watson designed, and what we're looking at again is how do we make sure that we standardize the data that we're collecting. We've got a lot of data that's been collected from these killer wells. We want to make sure it's most valuable wherever it's put. What we're finding is as we're designing the roadmap, we're actually probably going to have to put the data in a few places. But when we do that, we can use it. What we'd like to do in the future is just have one place where we can put it and have it be very useful to everyone involved. So I have a question for everyone in the room. When you're doing your investigations, especially folks that are working with individual animals and they need to add up to a population, do you put your data in a way that it can be retrieved and evaluated on a regular basis? Raise your hand if the answer is yes. All you people deserve an extra brownie. <laughs> a, because you're doing something that's critically important. For, yes, you can go get them now. <laughs> but what's important is um, we need to have that data available so that we can evaluate it and use it. If we don't, it's simply data sitting in a drawer. Um, and lastly, we want to integrate these investigations. And this is sort of the feedback I need from you. What I'd like to know is, let's say a killer whale showed up in your backyard. And it's your backyard at work because no one wants a dead killer whale in the backyard at home. But if that were the case and it were the perfect world, what sort of materials would you want collected? How would you want them collected? And what would they mean for your investigations relative to the ocean health or status of the ocean or the population of the species that live within it? What's important is, I'd like you to think now, because I'd like to integrate that kind of information into the new roadmap we're designing for investigating these cases in the future. There are a lot of things we can do. Imagine if we get an in-depth evaluation of animals now. Five years from now, it's not going to be hard to say, what are the changes in the endocrine hormones we see circulating in these animals when they die? But if we don't capture the data now, we won't have it in the future. And certainly I can't tell you what the hormone status was of animals five years ago because we didn't capture that data then. We certainly can make geographic comparisons. We know we have a lot of both stocks as well as distinct populations of killer whales. Well, that's killer whales. Think about all the species that you work with on a daily basis. There are a lot of specific populations that have, as we saw this morning with the specific feeding areas of the different pinnipeds, lots of geographically specific threats and concerns. We can evaluate them as long as we're looking for these problems. And lastly, we'd like to expand the data collection. Michelle Barberi has a paper in Press and Marine Mammal Science looking at sort of spatial and temporal analysis of killer whale strandings. And what's cool about this is from 1925 to 2011, there were 371 stranded killer whales. 
I'm going to be evaluating the stranded data from 26 of those 371 killer wells over the next couple months. There's a lot of information we can gain, but we need to have a way to do it to make it work. And if you look at the distribution of the strandings, certainly we need to look more than in just the Pacific Northwest and Alaska because we're missing a lot of data here. <laughs> what I'd like you to take home is we have a lot to learn from investigating the health and physical status of live animals, but we have almost as much, if not more, to learn from investigating what we see in these animals that have died and stranded. They are, for us, a snapshot of the ocean that we can't get on a boat. But it's one that doesn't tell us the whole picture, but the picture it gives us can be fabulous as long as we look very closely and we know how to do that looking at the time it's available to us. I think what we'll do, because I sucked up a bunch of my time, considering I didn't have that many slides to go over, is take questions later. Well, is there um, one or two uh, questions specific to and if not, I know I know that they're going to integrate quite well in with the with the discussion at the end. Oh, so that's so Yeah. Um, so I think uh, one of the issues with uh, standardized protocols and across protocols is that um, they may be um, at the extent of the capabilities of some of the responders, and particularly if we don't have um, financial or, or logistical support, how, I guess, um, are you guys proposing to kind of implement the, these baselines? I think it's great to have the, the goal, um, but how do we actually get people to that? So Sarah just presented an awesome question that we are going to try, that we're going to try to address with the Killer Well and Crossing Protocol. Um, I'll use an example that's, that's really important in the zoo world. In the zoo world, if an elephant dies, you get a phone call from a bunch of important people because elephants are very near and dear to the hearts of many folks and there's lots of research programs. And there's this 26 page complex necropsy protocol that you have to go through when an elephant dies. And by the time you're done with it, it's good that that poor creature has died because you hate it. <laughs> and, and wouldn't you hate it if this killer whale died and was in the backyard of your office and I hand you a 26 or 30 page protocol and said, here, I know you're by yourself and you have a scalpel, but this is what I'd like you to get done. <laughs> so what we're going to try to do is actually present, here's the scenario, here's what you probably can do, here's what would be the best things to do. A real problem, you can see this killer whale is alive. If, God forbid, this animal just died, it would be very fresh. And it would be the best case scenario for collecting samples, not only for health evaluations, but so many other evaluations. But let's say it had been dead five days, and it was warm. There's a lot of samples you could collect that probably wouldn't be terribly helpful. But what we're going to try to do is to give a variety of scenarios. So you can say, okay, I've got limited abilities. I've got limited time. Here's the primary things I need to collect, measure, and observe. Now, it won't be perfect. And what's nice is, because many of these projects are actually funded by other things, we just don't have ready access to all of those researchers that information will be available to you and sort of, hey, here's what you can do and what would be appreciated if feasible. And so the resources and the information that you almost never have should be available in one place. So hopefully we can address that because it's, it's a primary concern and certainly to me, a person who oftentimes is on the beach by themselves with a knife, I understand that issue. Along those same lines also is, you, when you get a, a whale in your backyard, you still get the same 26 phone calls of everyone that wants their protocols filled. But everyone wants their protocols filled and they all want their samples collected within the first 12 to 24 hours. Well, I mean, how do you prioritize whose samples are the most important and what needs, because you can't do everything in 24 hours. So we're gonna try to do what we call the beach necropsy collection kit. Beach necropsy <laughs> collection kit is grab one kilogram of liver because we're going to send you back to your office or your lab, preferably your lab, and have you cut that liver up into a bunch of different small pieces. It makes things easier logistically, and it should make things easier for collecting samples for researchers, but the goal is to try and keep this protocol updated so that you shouldn't get 26 phone calls from researchers, you should have the resources you need. Now having what you need is not always the be all and end all, but I think it's better than what we have right now when you just get the phone call. Yeah. 
So that, that, the update, is, is, I think, is, is key because you know researchers are finished with their projects or new ones come online, and so you go to ship something out. Oh, that person's not here anymore. Or it, and we're seeing this already with the the reissuing of the 2006 protocol. Many of the folks have moved, or you know, it was part of the graduate project and they're done. But also, there's so many expanded abilities that it's it's sort of a different paradigm. So we're looking at how do we assure the longevity of this. And that, boy, I'd like to talk with folks about that because assuring that this project doesn't last six months but actually lasts 30 or 40 years is what we need to make it be best practice.